Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have law school admissions expert Anna Ivey here with us to talk about applying to law school. Your law school toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have law school admissions expert Anna Ivy here with us to talk about applying to law school. So welcome, Anna. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you back. Well, to start off with, um, could you give our listeners just a quick sense of your professional background? Sure. I went to law school myself, so I feel your pain. (laughs) Uh, I went to the University of Chicago for law school. Then I practiced for a few years in corporate law, eventually specializing in film finance. Um, And then I had my quarter life crisis (laughs) and decided I didn't really want to practice law for the rest of my life. So I went back to my law school and joined the admissions team. Um, Eventually, I became dean of admissions. I've also worked in development at Stanford. Um, Development is just a fancy way of saying fundraising. (laughs) So I've seen how a lot of sausage gets made in higher education, for better or worse. And I've been able to see this whole process from all sides of the table, right? As an applicant, as a law student, as a practicing lawyer, as an admissions officer. Um, And I've been running this admissions consulting firm for over a decade now. So we work one-on-one with applicants to help them navigate the whole process and and make smart decisions. Um, And then, as you know, because we do it sometimes together, I like to keep creating content or at least updating it, whether that's books, blogs, newsletters, YouTube videos, being a guest on a podcast like yours. So Mm -hmm. here we are. Here we are. And where can people find all of the stuff if they're interested? Yeah, just come to AnnaIvy.com, A-N-N-A. Ivey.com. And you have a book as well. Can we get that anywhere? Yeah, that is called The Ivy Guide to Law School Admissions, which is available on Amazon. Um, there, the paper version is pretty old now, so I'd actually recommend doing the ebook, which I update regularly. Oh, nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. that seems a wave of the few, well, the wave of the current and the future. Yeah, um, paper books, you know, with with content that changes, it's it's a you know not the best way to go. All anymore. right, so get the ebook version. Um, yes. All right, well, let's jump right in. So. People often say, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, you know, law school admissions is just a number game. Your fate is totally determined by your LSAT and your GPA. You can just go put it in this calculator. It's going to tell you if you're going to get admitted. Do you think this is accurate? Uh, It's partially true. Certainly the LSAT and GPA in combination are a huge factor Mm -hmm. in the outcome. So you made reference to this calculator for your listeners. There's this calculator on the LSAC website. They made it, they make it weirdly hard to find, but once you find it, it's just this really powerful tool. And you only plug in two numbers, your GPA, your undergrad GPA, and your LSAT score. So those are the only two variables this calculator pays attention to. And then uh, for whatever numbers you plug in there, it spits out the odds of admission for a whole range of schools based on the previous year's admissions results. So if you plug in those two numbers and you play around with those numbers, you sort of dial them up or dial them down, you can see the odds of acceptance move pretty much in lockstep right. <laughs> with as a result. So, you know, I think it is fair to say that they correlate very strongly. But that being said, when it shows the odds, there are plenty of schools where the odds are going to come back in the middle, you know, sort of 40 to 60%. Mm. And then you have to ask yourself, well, in that zone, what kind of ac- applicant is actually getting in, right? Because right. you're sort of on the, they're, they're on the fence about you, basically, based on the numbers. So it's in that middle zone where all those non-number factors, what I call the soft factors and the soft parts of the application, most come into play and have the most power to tip you from one pile to the other. So those soft parts would include things like the essays, the recommendations, the interviews, how you position yourself and tell your story, your resume, 
resume, your life experience, and then all this follow up that you do after you submit your applications or should be doing after you submit your applications. Um, so that's just kind of a, to give you a sense, those, those non-numbers factors. And then, you know, if the odds are really low, say they're coming back, you know, 10%, well, somebody's getting in. Right, it's not right? zero. Not, not, not many, <laughs> but somebody's getting in. Um, and there too, you know, clearly there's something else going on besides just the numbers. Um, but at the same time, odds are odds. So it's a good way to manage your expectations. Um, and because I think when people are putting lists together, we're all susceptible to magical thinking in one part of our lives or another. And I see that come up a lot when, when people put lists together. So I love the calculator because it's just data. You know, the data isn't judgy. Right. You know, the data isn't magical thinking. The data isn't Anna Ivy's gut instinct, right? So I really like to use that to anchor, you know, the, the whole process of putting a list together. Mm -hmm. um, and if the odds are really high, you know, and that makes that school a safety, then by definition, you're a big catch for that school based just on the numbers. And then frankly, the rest of your application doesn't have to be great. It's okay just to be good enough. They're still going to want you. So, you know, how those other, those soft factors come into play and how much they matter really matters, uh, or I'm, I, I'm sorry, really depends on, you know, how, how hard that school is for you to get into. Right. So, I mean, I guess if schools say you're either on the cusp, I guess these may be two different categories too. So if you're kind of in that middle zone, what do you think mm -hmm. schools are really looking for beyond the numbers to decide like, okay, this person has the same, or these, these five people all have the exact same LSAT. They have basically yeah. the same GPA. What are they looking at to decide, okay, we want this one yeah. and not that one? Well, you know, everybody comes into the process with different experiences and different things that they bring to the table. But I would say on a macro level, they want you to know yourself. They want mm -hmm. you to have done that introspection to figure out, you know, why are you here knocking on our door? Wanting right, to make this, this make really, <laughs> making this really big investment of time and money. And even at a top law school, it's still an investment of time and money. And you can oh, for sure. lots of other things. And when, as you, as we all know, when markets, the employment market is not great, you know, even coming out of a top law school can be a little bit of a, a slog. Um, well, and I'm so definitely still that. paying back that top law school experience. So, <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very common. Um, so they want you to understand why you're there. And what I find with a lot of applicants, at least when they're starting the process, in their minds, they think, yes, I want to be a lawyer. I want to go to law school or their kind of parents are on their backs to go or whatever the case may be. But if you ask them, and it's part of my intake process in our questionnaire, we say, you know, why do you want to go to law school? And very often people have very little to say <laughs> in answer to that <laughs> question. It's kind of terrifying. Which is fine at the start, but you're going to have to do that homework and that soul searching and that research to really get to know both yourself and what you want and what you need and then, you know, what schools match up with that. And sometimes going through that exercise leads to the conclusion that no, you shouldn't be doing this. Right. <laughs> it's not a good investment. You should be doing, you know, other things. And that's fine too. You know, I think they're there, there are days where I, I joke that I'm the anti-admissions consultant because, you know, our our priority is not just to kind of push people into law school. Right. Um, and our whole team is very clear on that. Um, our priority is to help you do what makes the most sense for you. And sometimes that means, yes, go to law school. And at the end of the day, we'll always support you, you know, if you do want to go to law school, but this is all about managing expectations. Mm -hmm. So you have to know yourself and that has to come through in the application certainly. Um, and then you also have to think really about the, the totality of your life experience and think about, okay, what are the parts that are worth showcasing here? And where do I best show them off in the application? Because you have these different pieces of the application. That's a bit of an art and a science because, you know, there you have to fit it into the four corners of that application. And it's not a long application. Even the personal statement is two pages double spaced. You know, it's not Moby Dick. Right. Um, and so if you are also thoughtful about what you cherry pick out of your whole life to tell them about and then, you know, and then convey it in a coherent way. Um, and well-written way, those those two things are huge. And a lot of people, a lot of people applying to law school don't have 
either of those, you know, sometimes they might have just one of those two things. But, you know, if you really want to succeed in this process, you have to be good at both of those things. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then what about these people who are in that, you know, 10% who clearly <laughs> don't have the numbers? I mean, that that seems like something fundamentally yeah. different is going on there. Like what's going there, on there? Yes. And I would say that those are those are people where you you as an applicant looking at that it's really not the kind of thing that you can go out and engineer. Right. Because it usually you has like some... been a refugee yeah, or something. Yeah, it usually <laughs> has something about, something to do with who you are, what you've lived through. Um, and that's not something you just go out and do, you know, yeah. in a month or two. And sometimes it's, you know, you can't change who you are either, you know, and your life experience is just not quite that unusual. Um, but they're out there, right? But yes, in the spirit of managing expectations, you know, um, I wouldn't put too much stock in, you know, those 10% odds, but certainly there's no downside to applying, you know, if the application fee isn't a problem for you and you'd spend the rest of your life wondering, oh, you know, what would have happened if only I had applied to Yale Law School? Or could I have gotten applying? into Harvard? You know? <laughs> I could have gotten into Harvard. <laughs> now, I will say, and you and I both went to so-called top schools, right? You went to Columbia, I went mm -hmm. to Chicago, and... What I've noticed over the years with that calculator is that the top schools have been sort of opting out of participating in Oh, it, interesting. Which I find really kind of shameless and naughty because I think this whole process should have more transparency rather than less. And I understand why they do it. They don't want you to look at those 10 <laughs> those 10 percent odds and say you know what i'm not even gonna bother for a variety of reasons they you know if you're interested in them they would still like you to apply um but i think they basically don't want people to get scared away but the reality is they are very hard to get into right right but it, it's frustrating because if you look at the top 10 schools they're the most likely to have opted out so you have all this data once you go down a little bit further down the list, um, but for those top schools, you have less data. But I would say there are always proxies. So for example, if one year Penn is participating, but Chicago isn't, that's fine. They're roughly proxies. Right. You know, you can use <laughs> proxies to figure out your odds. Or if, you know, UVA one year is showing 25% odds, you know what? You can assume then that Stanford is going to be harder. Right. <laughs> you know, so you can just apply some common sense even when schools aren't, aren't participating. But yeah, that's a bone I have to pick. I think, you know, trying to make the process more cloaked and opaque is not the right direction. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, just tell people what their odds are, and then they can make a rational decision about it. Yeah, it's the same thing with OCI. You get all these weird things. Ups, you know, yes, exactly. People yeah. are applying to firms they have literally no shot at. And it's like, that's fine for one or two, but don't do that for all 10. Right. Um, well, on that topic, actually, what do you think people should really be thinking about when they are assembling this list of schools to apply to? I mean, should it just be like, hey, you know, this is what it says my... 70 to 90 percent chances i'm just going to apply to these 10 schools that are all over the country and hope for the best yeah again that goes back to knowing yourself and why you're even doing this right and people's goals are different um and once you drill down and think a little bit more specifically about where you want to end up and what kinds of things you want to be doing you know what you don't need to just go down the rankings you right. know i mean if you want to be like a real estate baron in louisiana truly you do not need to go to harvard you, uh, don't. you should go to tulane you know? done you should go to tulane <laughs> you should go to lsu yeah. you know the, the, once you once you drill down a little bit you scratch that surface you really have to come up with your own ranking i think the u.s news rankings fall apart very very quickly once you scratch the surface a bit um and, you know, to your point, though, when we were chatting before, and it was for one of my YouTube conversations, I believe, um, where you were my guest, we had a whole conversation about how, you know what, you don't really have to think too much about what specifically you want to do when you're putting your list together. But I've thought about that some more. Um, mm. You know, we're, we're kind of our own little case studies, right? Because I ended up doing entertainment law. I had nothing to do with entertainment law before law school or during law school, right? right. And then I think you had a, a similar experience, right, um, on, on your end. Um, and I, you know, as I've reflected on that some more, I think you have the most freedom to just kind of go find yourself if it's a top law school. Oh, for sure. It's kind of an insurance policy because that brand is so strong and the alumni network is so 
well connected that you know you have some freedom just to kind of well uh, you know I'll figure it out when I get there or after um, I think though that once once you're outside of the, that kind of very narrow band of, of top law schools I think you owe it to yourself to really think carefully about what that law school is actually going to do for you and that might actually have something to do with the curriculum so anyway I just I thought about it some more and I think there is that sort of nuance um, that is is worth adding um, the other thing I would say is that I don't always recommend the same approach that I would for uh, college admissions so when you're applying to college you're used to okay I have to diversify my list so I'm going to have the reaches and the targets and the safeties and I think for college that makes a whole lot of sense because there's so much data to support the the fact that the difference between going to college and not going to college is huge right and so you've got to you've got to go somewhere right. so you've got to have those safeties on the list with law school again you know it's one of many things you could be doing you don't have to go to law school and it is expensive. And so I would say as you're putting your list together, yes, you want to manage your expectations and be realistic. But at the same time, you might decide for what my goals are. Maybe they're fairly lofty. Maybe my goals really are only realistic if I'm coming out of, you know, these schools over here. I'm completely fine if your whole list is reaches, mm -hmm. as long as you understand they are reaches and you might not be going to law school at all right. with this list. And that might be the right outcome, right? You might decide, you know what, I've got, I've got other options. I've got other ways to accomplish things in my life that I want to accomplish. So this only makes sense if it's this batch of schools over here. But again, that assumes you know yourself. That assumes you know the schools really well. And that just requires some some time and some reflection. Not not everyone does it. Um, there's the what I call the spaghetti method, right? You throw spaghetti at the wall and hope that something sticks, or people just kind of very robotically go by the rankings, um, which actually gets tricky, um, especially if they're in a waitlist situation, because if you get that call from a waitlist, you're not going to have a whole lot of time. Right. They're pretty much, just, gonna, I mean, I assume yeah. they don't necessarily want to answer on the spot, but yeah, probably they're within looking like to fill that hours spot or something. Right then and there. And sure, if it's, if it's Stanford calling, you know, you're probably going to say yes. But um, once you're outside a very small number of schools, people go into a panic. I mean, they really fall apart during that wait list stage <laughs> because like, Have they haven't done, thought about this. <laughs> they have, no, they haven't. They haven't done that hard work of really thinking about what is my own personal ranking, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and even before the pandemic, a lot of people don't visit law schools. So they're trying to decide whether to accept an offer and they haven't even set foot there, right? So getting to the wait list stage, or even the deposit stage, you know, which is in April typically, that's really not the best time to be thinking about these things in a serious way. <laughs> you know, you right. should have done that a lot sooner. Um, you really need to be thinking about that when you're putting the list together. And I would argue that also helps you in the actual application because even if, for example, a personal statement prompt doesn't say explicitly, you know, why do you want a law degree? Why do you want to come here? In which case, you know, you should have something sensible to say, um, a lot of law schools do interviews now. And hmm. almost certainly it will come up in the interview. And what are you going to say without sounding like a ding dong? <laughs> like, why are right? you in this interview? <laughs> right. right. Uh, and, you know, you can't just say oh, rankings, right? Um, so, yeah, I would say think about it um, in a serious way and think about it in the earlier stages rather than in the later stages, which is when a lot of people do it and then just panic. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I feel like at least I remember when I was applying, I definitely only was basically going to go to law school in New York, although I applied some places in California where mm -hmm. I was living. And I'm pretty sure that like a large part of the reason I did not get into Stanford was because I basically wrote an essay targeted for Columbia <laughs> and then sent go. it to sent yeah. it to Stanford with change the name. Um, and I think they could kind of tell that. Yeah, but at the same time, I, th I actually think it's very helpful when people have a geographic goal. Um, so, you know, some people know, mm -hmm. gosh, I really want to end up in New York and maybe there's a stakeholder in this decision. There's a spouse or whatever, you know, whose location also matters to you. Um, 
you know, then I think it's fine to focus on a particular geographic area and then put your list together. And okay, these are harder to get into than those. But what I see very often is people just go straight by the rankings, which is, well, first of all, you know, there's something like 200 ABA approved law schools right, like, out well, how there. Do you You're pick? not like, what are you going <laughs> to do? Um, but, you know, they'll go straight down the rankings and they'll say, okay, well, I think we talked about this before too. They'll say, oh, well, you know, I'll apply to a law school in Colorado because it's ranked four slots above the school in Pennsylvania and I'm like uh, have you been to Colorado do you know anyone there? right <laughs> do you have any kind you of you want network? to live in the mountains do like you, is that you appealing? know it's, it's just <laughs> it just doesn't make sense in the cold light of day but I can understand how people get sucked into that thinking um so I think it's sort of our job to <laughs> pull people away from that and um look at it a bit more clearly yeah, we definitely get some weird questions where I'm like, huh, I, you can't figure this one out on your own. You know? <laughs> but OK, here, I'll, a random stranger on the Internet, I will give you my opinion on what you should do with your life. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, tr we try. We yeah. try. Um, yeah, no, I think that's so key to really know what you're thinking, you know, know what you're looking for. I think, I mean, in general, I think people who were more successful and happier that I knew in law school and afterwards who were still actually practicing attorneys, most of them, you know, they kind of knew what they wanted to do going in. Oh, I agree 100%. I mean, I did not know. I didn't either. I was <laughs> what just I like, wanted to go. Oh, I want to live in New York, whatever, it, I'll go to law yeah. school. Sure, and when I, when, I, when I think back, um, or when I see now, where people have ended up and what they're doing, um, I realized, oh, the ones who actually had a plan coming in really got more out of it. Oh, they were much sure. more focused. And they were also not, they were focused not just in terms of what classes they were taking, they were also really focused with their OCI, their on campus recruiting, and the kinds of um, employers they were going after. And they were then able to sort of leverage that, even the ones that aren't practicing law anymore, and that's actually quite a few, um, they were then able to leverage that legal experience into, you know, something bigger and better, but it was still because they had gotten themselves there. So I think that is definitely the smarter way to do it. And I, I think it's not a coincidence that in most cases, those are also people who have been out in the working world before going to law school. I think that's so important. Um, I think you will get more out of law school and you will you will be a better law student and you will be a better lawyer because of it. Um, I think if, if your only goal is to be an academic, then fine. You know, then you really only need <laughs> academic experience and you need to know yourself in your academic life. But that's not the case for most people. So um, I mean, that's really not a realistic goal for most it's people not, anyway. You know, even people who <laughs> want to be academics, I mean, talk about a brutal job market. My yeah. God. Well, like, are that's you at Yale? Just, okay, let's not have this conversation. Um. It's just <laughs> grim. Even, even coming out of Yale. Yeah. I mean, it's not, that doesn't mean you're going to be teaching at Yale. Oh, right? for sure. Um, it's, 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 gr it's, gr academia full stop is, is grim, whether it's law school or, or otherwise, but anyway. Yeah, that's, that's true. I have professor friends. Yeah. And they're even a generation yeah. ahead of like the worst of it. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, actually let's, yeah. uh, let's switch gears a little bit because that uh -huh. kind of leads into some of the things I wanted to talk with you briefly about. Um, let's talk about a few common scenarios. And you kind of just mm -hmm. touched on this one. So I'm applying <laughs> right out of college. I really don't have a lot of exposure to the law. I don't have a lot of work experience. Is this mm -hmm. going to be a problem for getting admitted? Um, it doesn't have to be a deal breaker. I mean, law schools do take people right out of college. Um, are you going to be a stronger applicant if you're not coming right out of college? Yes. And that doesn't even necessarily require a whole lot of exposure to law. Um, but, you know, if you're coming right out of college, you haven't been out in the working world. And so typically then your only options to talk about uh, when you're presenting yourself are things in the classroom that got you interested in the law. You know, maybe it was a kind of baby constitutional law class, or maybe it was an internship, you know, at a pro bono clinic or something, you know, and then you, you gotta, you know, you've got to use what you have. And so in those scenarios, that's usually what you have. There are instances where people's life experience has basically expose them to the law. Maybe they were immigrants or, you know, whatever the case may be, in which case, okay, then you actually have a compelling personal story to talk about because you've had that exposure to the law. But, you know, in your hypothetical here, they haven't had a lot of exposure to right. law. Um, so, yeah, then you're grasping at academic experiences, maybe internships. Um, and then I would say you really have to sound plausible 
than when you're talking about your goals, the forward looking part. You know, if you don't have that much to talk about in the backwards looking part, okay, let's talk about the forward looking part. You know, what are your goals and how is a law degree going to help you achieve them? And I will say that in, when you're writing about why law school and when people are really str struggling with what to say, at least for two pages, I find that when, when I say why law school, that can be kind of paralyzing. Mm -hmm. When I reframe it as what problems do you want to solve, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they open up. So I would say just reframe it a bit and think think about what problems you want to solve and how does a law degree fit into that? And you might discover, oh, it doesn't actually, <laughs> or there are six other ways I could kind of be effective in, in that way without having to have a law degree. But, you know, at bottom line is the law degree should, you know, add some kind of value for that, for mm -hmm. that goal. And then that's what you write about. So maybe then you're, you're more forward looking because you just don't have that much in, in the past, right? right? That is terribly, terribly interesting or compelling. And what if I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, okay, you're making a compelling case that I shouldn't apply straight out of law school. But if I'm looking realistically mm -hmm. at my options, my options are mm -hmm. kind of working at Starbucks for two years. Yeah, like, is yeah. that going to improve? I mean, do you think that is a benefit at all just by being out in the world? Or do you think that makes no difference? Oh, gosh, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer to that. I mean, a lot of people write out recessions by going to grad school, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whenever the market turns ugly, there's what's called a flight to safety, right? And then you think, well, then I'd rather just ride this out and have a degree at the end. Um, but you and I both know a lot of unhappy JDs, Oh, right? for sure. And so even in that scenario, uh, you know, there's this phrase, I don't know who came up with it. It's at this point, it's a cliche. But the idea is, if you're going to spend all this time and effort building a ladder to get to the top of the building, make sure the ladder is leaned up against the right building, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I <laughs> did I, this. I did this straight out of undergrad, because I graduated not quite into a recession. But basically, like, you know, I, yeah, I literally, I, did too. Yeah. I literally mm -hmm. graduated a year early, like moved to LA, got a job, my only job I could get was working at Eddie Bauer. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and then I did temp stuff for a while and then I went to architecture graduate school, you know, and that was kind of like, okay, sure. I'll do that. And I mean, I didn't even want right. to be an architect. Like, what was I doing? Right. I don't know. <laughs> right. And so I would say if money is no object, sure, go get a whole bunch of shiny degrees and, you know, occupy your time. I think for most people, money is an object. I'm still paying right? for that degree too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think for most people, there is a real cost to going out and getting a shiny degree. So you just really have to make sure that um, it's it's justified. Right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's switch completely. So I'm actually mm -hmm. a non-traditional applicant. I have lots mm -hmm. of prior work experience. Maybe I have a whole other real career Mm -hmm. Is this going to be a problem? And also, like, undergrad was a while ago. Is it mm -hmm. still that important? Yeah. So, first of all, I think admissions officers love those kinds of applicants. I wouldn't even necessarily call them non-traditional right. in this context. Um, and they love seeing that prior experience, work experience, life experience. Um, and so, that is not in any way uh, a liability or a negative. And it's so interesting because when we hear from what I call older and wiser applicants uh they all assume it's a negative right and they all assume like oh my gosh this is something i'm gonna have to massage or spin or you know compensate for and i'm like no 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 yeah, <laughs> this is a good thing this is a feature not a bug um so you certainly have a lot more to talk about and you probably have a whole lot more credibility about why you're taking this step um the part that's trickier is that um because undergrad was a while ago it's probably next to impossible to go back and get academic recommendations mm. and law schools do prefer academic recommendations but you know that's all else being equal and they completely understand that that might just not be realistic i mean even with recent undergrads you know if you went to florida state or ucla you know, good luck getting yeah. an academic recommendation. Maybe you had a thesis advisor or something. We hear that all the time. Or, you know, a story I heard out of UCLA was, you know, I, I have this professor, I did really well in his class, but he said his policy is I won't re write a recommendation for you unless you were my teaching assistant. Mm. Oh, God. You know, so that's a problem even if, you know, you're not out of school for a long time. But uh, admissions officers understand that reality. So that doesn't have to be a deal breaker at all. But... 
the transcript still matters. Mm -hmm. Your academic performance is still really important to law school admissions officers, even if it was, you know, a longer time ago. And sometimes that requires some explaining. You know, maybe you weren't the best student back then, but you're also not that person anymore. Right. Right. Um, in which case, okay, write an addendum. You know, you don't necessarily have to use your word count in your personal statement to explain that, um, but do write an addendum because otherwise they're going to look at your undergrad transcript, and this is true for any applicant. The reason they care so much about your undergrad transcript is not just because in the grand scheme of things, they really prefer people who have, you know, distinguished themselves in some way, um, but more practically, they use that as a proxy to try to predict how you're going to do in law school. So they want to look at how you did previously in a demanding academic environment to try to get some comfort that you will do well in their own demanding academic environment. And so if that older transcript is really not um, accurate with respect to who you are now and what kind of student you would be, then, you know, make that case, do it in an addendum. I think it's a harder case to make if it was really recent. Right. I've changed so much in the last 18 months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true for any kind of, even for like a required disclosure. You know, if you have three alcohol-related incidents that you have to disclose, well, you know, a year later, or, you know, have you changed that much? I don't know. You know, so the passage of time probably works in your favor in mm -hmm. a lot of these cases, right? Because you've had a chance to go out and rehabilitate being, you know <laughs> in one form or another and 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 what some people do is you know they might have some kind of grad school experience before law school that shows a better track record right i was gonna ask about that because sometimes people undergrad. say they say mm -hmm. again like well it doesn't matter your grad school that you did better yeah. like because it, it can yeah 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 to the extent it supports that argument um so I wouldn't say go to grad school just <laughs> to get into law school. You know, again, this is the whole problem with just piling up shiny degrees, right? But um, if you're thoughtful about it and the, and the say, whatever the master's degree is or maybe a certificate, uh, if it actually makes sense in terms of your trajectory and your goals and the story you're telling about yourself. Um, for example, right now, people are quarantined. Um, you know, there's some wonderful certificate programs out there, mm. you know, Penn, Penn is an example. They have wonderful certificate programs. Fine, you know, if you want to learn how to read a financial statement or a balance sheet, which I argue every graduating law school uh, student should know I would know really to like do, to have done that. Right? Uh, <laughs> fine, go take advantage of this quarantine, right? And and go do that. And then you have something to put on your resume, you know? maybe Or maybe there are just skills you need to refresh if you've been out of school for a while. Those are all good signs, you know? Yeah. So you can be a bit proactive about that. Or even but community say, college. Or community college. I, I still take classes at community college. I was I free in college. San Francisco. Yeah, there you go. I take classes at Santa Monica College. I love it, you know. Um, so it's it's okay to be sort of a lifelong learner. And in fact, I would argue that's what lawyers have to be. Uh, for sure. I mean, that's what you do. You yeah. basically walk into a case, at least as a litigator, and suddenly it's like, okay, yeah, you're doing a you're, case on, you know, right. hardware, you pat to or learn new whatever, stuff. you know, like yeah. tires. I don't know, you know, all kinds of different things. And you have to become exactly. an expert. Exactly. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Talk to me about the LSAT. So, you know, mm -hmm. people are like, I've never been that great at standardized tests, but mm -hmm. then I have really good grades. You know, my LSAT is also not the best. Do schools, I mean, do they listen to this story? They'll listen. <laughs> Whether <laughs> it actually it? moves <laughs> the needle. They only have so much wiggle room to overlook the LSAT. Yeah. Um, for reasons that are totally bigger than you and totally out of your control. Um, they have to care about the LSAT because those get reported. Those get reported to the ABA. That in turn factors into, that's where the rankings get the data from. So even if schools don't want to participate, they don't really have a choice. The data is out there, are out there. Um, I study Latin, so every once in a while I'll <laughs> use it as the correct plural, but then I sound like a dork. Um, it's interesting, though, all these colleges are going test optional, even mm -hmm. before the pandemic. That was this big movement that was already in progress. Law schools have just sort of doubled down, just adding another test. Like, well, <laughs> if you don't want to do the LSAT, you know, go take the GRE. Um, they can't actually just abandon the testing requirement, even if they wanted to, because that, too, is an ABA requirement. Mm. I would argue an absurd one. I think the role of the LSAT is just as 
<sighs> suspect as it is in as, as standardized tests are in, in undergrad, um, but they're required for now. And so if you're not great at tests, may, I think your best argument is to be able to show, hey, you know, when I took the SAT or the ACT, you know, my percentile wasn't that great, but then I graduated in the top 10% of my college class. So right. there's just kind of a weak connection. There's a weak correlation between how I do on standardized tests and then how I actually perform. And, you know, I think that's what's happening here too. Right. But at I'll the same time, you know, I think, what other argument are you really going to make? Because if if you just had a bad day during the test, well, go take it again, yeah. right? Well, and I think realistically, if you are someone who's just never performed well on standardized tests, the reality is you have to be thinking about the bar exam down the road because that, that is, is the world's biggest standardized true. test. That is true. And honestly, I think that is really the only compelling argument in favor of doing doing the LSAT. I think the GRE is just a dumb exam, so I don't have a lot of respect <laughs> for it. The LSAT is actually really hard. It's rigorous. I think it's the hardest. I think it's the hardest. Cognitively, it's the hardest of the standardized tests. Um, and, you know, substantively, does it matter so much? I, probably not. But in terms of how hard it is and how you have to study for it, you know, I've seen people write an addendum where they say, well, you know, I just get, I, I have test anxiety and I freak out during high stakes tests. And I'm like, okay, that's not helping you. Yeah, and you're like, don't <laughs> tell, tell them that. that. <laughs> because law school is full of high stakes tests. And then of course you have the mother of all high stakes tests at the end, which is the bar exam, right? right. Um, I took two different bar exams, two different states. At the time they were both three days long. Ugh. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing admissions officers actually have to worry about right, because they have to report their bar passage rates. And, and frankly, it's not doing you any favors either. They don't want to set you up for failure. Right. It doesn't make sense know? to take your money for three years and then have you not be no. able to pass the bar and, and never and practice. And shamelessly, some schools do. And are know? in they're, danger of being deaccredited because of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, they're basically diploma mills. So I think if you're not, if the standardized test really is a huge problem for you, I would think very carefully <clears throat> about going to law school, um, not least because of this, you know, bar exam at the end. Right. right. And if you do go, I think you need to be thinking about that literally from basically like the early days of like, you know, yeah. how am and I, I thinking think it, about passing this in, test? In an indirect way, I think it also has to do with cost because the higher you push that score, the more schools are going to want to discount your tuition right. <laughs> in order to get you, because they want your numbers, basically, for all those reporting purposes. So, you know, the higher that number is, um, the less you might end up paying. And I would say if your score is really low and you're not able to get into a good law school, it doesn't have to be a great one, but maybe even a good law school is out of your reach, for the love of God, you know, don't pay a lot of money to do it. No. You know, and certainly don't borrow to do it. Well, that's right? what's shocking is a lot of these schools that are pretty terrible yes. are actually the ones with the highest debt loads, which that's is horrifying. Right. That's right. And um, the last thing we would want for you is to go to law school and make you worse off than you were before. And that's been true for a whole lot of people. You oh, know? yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I think it's an incredibly expensive decision for a lot of people. And, you know, the bar passage rates at some of these schools, particularly in places like California, are truly mm -hmm. horrific. And, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. I would strongly encourage people not to consider signing up for this unless they're pretty sure they're not going to be in one of the, you know, that category. Yeah. Because because law is a legal cartel, right? right. You're only allowed to practice if you have, you know, joined this brotherhood and jumped through these hoops, right? Yeah. And so it, for ex there are other more versatile degrees out there. You know, you don't have a cartel if you get an MBA. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even have a geographic restriction if you go get an MBA, right? So if I qualify to practice in New York, I can't just go practice in California. I have to right. take a whole other bar exam, right, and pass a whole other <laughs> bar process right? don't even talk so, to us about the california bar right now it's very <laughs> yeah it's very restrictive whereas really mba you could take that anywhere in the world well, right people so, who want to do you know public policy or something and think they have to go to yeah. law school it's like you could go no, do a go public get an policy MPP. Degree. yeah, yeah. I, I have that conversation a lot you know if you are really driven mission driven in terms of public policy 
you do not have to have a JD to go do that. You know, maybe you'd like to have a JD, but you don't have to have a JD. There are other ways. Well, there right, might be more be, interesting things to do. You know, my sister went to SEPA yeah. at Columbia after I was yeah. at law school. And frankly, I think her yeah. job was more interesting than mine. Yeah, well, probably SEPA was more interesting than law school. Oh, well, um, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> right. What scares a lot of people away who want the JD, who might be better served by an MPP, what scares a lot of them away is the quant component mm -hmm. of MPP, right? And so in their minds, you know, that's prohibitive. You know, I'm not good at math, so I, you know, I can't go do this, this degree that's going to require math stuff. But you know what, honestly, you're going to need some math stuff as a lawyer too. Right. <laughs> that's just I mean, the reality of yeah. it. So, you know, All buckle right. down, buckle yeah. down. Suck it up, learn some algebra. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Exactly. I think it's mostly statistics, frankly, which is actually a very useful skill set to have. It's so useful. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, the story I tell, and it's sort of, you know, it's anecdotal. It's a one-off. But I remember we spent an entire class once when I was in law school talking about, I think, whether it was Judge Easterbrook got the regression analysis correct in footnote seven. <laughs> I remember that happens, you know, it's that, that I remember a crazy. class where a professor asked someone to subtract something and she just looked oh, at him no. blankly and she says, I don't do math. He's like, it's basic oh. subtraction. She's oh. like, yeah, I can't do that in my head. We're like, wow. It was wow. like 20 minus eight, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was really bad. I was just like, yeah. whoa, okay. This isn't, how do you function in the world? <laughs> Well, you know, that's where we're grateful for computers and robots. True. And our phones Such. being able to do every yes. math problem for yes. us. All right. No well, question. before we wrap up, because we're way over time, mm -hmm. let's actually touch briefly on financial aid since lawyers are not yes. good with numbers. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you think it's a good idea to sort of intentionally apply places that you might not really want to go that you think you can get solid scholarships from, maybe to use as leverage? And like, what is the kind of gap here where that might really yeah. work? Yeah. You know, let the... The reality is that what gives you leverage, if it's if the money, if the offer is from a roughly a peer school, if it's not a peer school, if it's just sort of in a different bucket of law schools in terms of prestige and you know all the rest of it, um, they're not going to care, right? <laughs> right? It's like, oh, because you they got this know that scholarship to yeah, like you know the worst law school in your state, <laughs> right? So they know <laughs> it's apples and oranges. But the smaller that gap is, then the more leverage you have, because then it's just more realistic that you might actually turn them down to go take this, you know, this very close offer, you know, at a much lower price point. Um, so, but as we were alluding to before. Oh, if you can get those numbers up, that is actually your best ticket to getting money. Right. Um, and in the higher ed world, this is true undergrad too, they don't even call them scholarships internally. They call them tuition discounts, which is all <laughs> they are. Now, they call them scholarships because we all have egos. It sounds nicer, yeah. People feel wanted and special, but it really just comes down to, you know, at the law school level, scholarships are a recruiting tool they want you because of something that is good for them there are some exceptions you know harvard yale stanford i believe are need-based only so they don't even engage in this nonsense but pretty much everybody else does engage in this nonsense um and so whatever you can invest in getting those numbers up you know ethically legally right very often does pay for itself so even if it doesn't even if you end up going to the same law school that you otherwise uh, would have with lower numbers, you're almost certainly going to pay less for it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I think that's definitely true. And, you know, people don't realize they can negotiate this stuff. It's like, no, it doesn't hurt to ask. That's and they can say really, no. that's a, such a good point. And that's where um, truly non-traditional students like first generation or whatever are at such a disadvantage because they just, how would they know right. that this is just the opening salvo, right? Now, I remember actually at the Admitted Students Day, I think mm -hmm. someone from the admissions office basically invited us to negotiate our, sal our, our salary, our scholarships. And we're, I was <laughs> yeah. just like, oh, you can what? do that? Yeah. And I did, right. and it worked. And I was like, great. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a really good example of um, a, an instance where I think the schools think they're being really transparent, but they're absolutely not. And I think it's a function of us all being in our own little bubbles, right? And so things seem completely obvious to us that aren't to other people. And, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with some admissions officers where, you know, some of them are skeptical about admissions consultants because they're like, 
you know, what value could you possibly add? And I'm like, well, let me give you a list of things that right. people genuinely don't understand, you know, and there's, there's that disconnect. Um, right. And I don't think it's that they're trying to withhold, you know, information, except for that calculator. So I'll keep wrapping their knuckles for that. But, you know, otherwise, for example, I don't think they're terribly transparent about the fact that there's all this stuff that you can still do to advocate for yourself after you submit your applications. Oh, That's I've learned not, things recently, actually, from right? speaking to someone who worked with you. And I was like, you can oh, do that? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. And that's, and, that's not the, <laughs> and that's not the case in undergrad, right? With undergrad, you hustle to put together a really good application, get it in by the deadline, and then you just kind of sit back and wait for them to decide your fate. You absolutely don't want to do that with law school. But is that obvious anywhere if you go to their websites or look at their admissions stuff? No. And so people project their experience from undergrad onto law school, and that's a big mistake. But yeah. that's just one example where they think it's all completely obvious, and it's not. And then it really, the system really does work to the benefit of sort of insiders or people who can one way or another, you know, get access to good information. Um, there's a huge information asymmetry out there, and, you know, it is what it is. No, I'm still learning things, and I figure I I think I'm a fairly well informed person about this sort of thing. I literally learned something yesterday that just shocked me from one of your <laughs> clients. And we can talk well, about that offline. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm really curious. I was I was very impressed. I was like, wow, okay, awesome. Well, unfortunately, we are really out of time here. Any final thoughts you want to share on this? Um, no, I, you know, I think we've probably sounded very discouraging in this podcast, and I don't mean to sound unduly discouraging, right? This law school might absolutely be the right thing for you. And it might absolutely be a worthwhile pursuit. Um, again, this is about magical thinking. Don't succumb to it. Be realistic about it. And I would say even right up until the bitter end, you know, even if you put a deposit down somewhere, if you decide, you know what, this isn't the right thing for me, walk away. Oh, it's okay. Even after you it's, start. Like yes, this. it's walk away, you know, don't double down. Um, we can give you lots of examples of people who walked we, away from law school and they're pretty yes. happy about that. If it's the yes, right thing, I, do it. If not, get out. I still get, get emails from people that I talked out of law school and they still write me and they're like, thank you so much, <laughs> you know, so those are just as valuable. Yeah. I think it's just so, about finding the right fit, you know, it's like, is yes. this the right thing for you? If not, yes. then don't do it. But it's easy to be kind of lazy about it, right? And be like, yeah. well, a law degree is always valuable and safe. <laughs> oh and I'll just go down the rankings. And No, don't be lazy about it. It's too big a decision. It's too big an investment. So don't be lazy is the bottom line. I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And remind people where they can find out more about your work if they're interested. Yeah, my website is AnnaIvy.com, A-N-N-A-I-V-E-Y.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed Thanks, this. Allison. Always fun. Uh, great. Well, with that, we are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.